Welcome everyone. I'm Alonzo Plough of Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. We are really thrilled to preview the charting a course for an equity-centered uh, data system. And I'm excited to join this uh, distinguished uh, group of presenters uh, who our moderator will introduce in just a, a few moments. This, um, this webinar is being recorded uh, and the recording will be shared via email. Uh, just a few housekeeping tips. All microphones are muted except of the presenters. Um, please, please use the chat features to share your, uh, your questions or comments uh, in the chat box. Uh, use the raise hand feature if you cannot hear us or you have other technical difficulties uh, and text uh, and support will have their cameras off working in the background to help this all move uh, smoothly. Um, I think the uh, next slide, uh, the agenda uh, on uh, the agenda here, we're the, at my welcoming, uh, as you can see, after I speak, um, we'll get a, uh, I'll be turning it over to uh, uh, Gail Christopher, who will lead the panel discussion and really dig into the commission's findings and recommendations, uh, followed by a Q&A. We have a, a poll question uh, that we would like you to fill out. Um, uh, which field or sector do you work in? Uh, we really would like to get a chance to know who, who, who is here today. So if you could fill out that poll question and uh, I think uh, after you do that quickly, uh, the data will, uh, will miraculously appear. I'll take a moment for that to happen. Great. Uh, the poll questions are, are out, um, and uh, you can see we have mostly people from government. Business is also represented. You can see all of the sectors that are represented. And as you'll see from the uh, questions and discussions we're going to have later, we need all of these sectors uh, working together in order to uh, address the recommendations of the commission. So uh, the next slide, please. Before I turn it over to Dr. Christopher, for some of you who don't know us, uh, Robert Wood Johnson Foundation is the largest philanthropy in the United States focused on health and healthcare. We've been working for almost 50 years in partnership with many others to build a culture of health uh, rooted in equity that provides every individual with a fair and, and just opportunity to thrive. And for this culture of health, in particular health equity to exist, we need a modern agile public health data system that guides decisions to really help communities to, to spur action uh, so that communities thrive and not merely respond to the next threat uh, uh, once it's upon us. Next slide, please. The foundation has been invested in looking at the public health data infrastructure for many, many years, uh, supporting multiple efforts uh, to provide community leaders and residents with a range of health and data resources, as well as data about the drivers of health uh, at the state, county, city, and census tract level. So the things we're talking about today and catalyzed by this work really builds upon that ongoing work. These data resources have allowed communities to uncover health challenges, better target resources, uh, and, and measure progress for ensuring that everyone can achieve good health. Uh, but we've seen the last couple of years with the pandemic, the delayed uh, racial awakening, awakening in this country. Uh, there's much, much more that we need to do uh, to advance health equity. And having data that tell the right story is essential uh, to, change, to developing the changes we need to see. Again, this is a broad recognition, I think, of, of the importance of equity uh, and racial equity specifically. Uh, as, as we address uh, uh, the issues of how data can help get to, get to the ends that we hope to achieve. And I'll just read this quote, a recent quote from the CDC uh, director, Rachel Walensky, racism is a serious public health threat that directly affects the well-being of millions of Americans. As a result, it affects uh, the health of our entire nation. So the CDC and more than 200, um, 200 uh, organizations uh, uh, state and local organizations 
have declared racism as a public health crisis. And it's really incumbent on all of us to make sure that these data systems, they actually give us the information that reflects the harm that racism and other forms of discrimination have on communities. The disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on communities of color have largely mirrored these long-standing patterns of social, racial, and economic disparities among our populations. Robert Wood Johnson Foundation established this first-of-a-kind national commission to transform public health data systems to really reimagine how data are collected, how they're shared and used, and to identify what both public and private investments are needed to improve health equity. We really look forward to using this report to guide our work moving forward uh, in, in including a major new funding effort that I will talk more about uh, in, in just a minute. It's now uh, my honor to introduce Gail Christopher, uh, uh, the director of uh, the commission and uh, the executive director of the National Collaborative for Health Equity. Uh, Gail is an award-winning social change agent known for her pioneering work to infuse holistic health and diversity concepts into public sector programs and, and policy discourse. In her role as the senior advisor and vice president at the Kellogg Foundation, W.K. Kellogg Foundation, she was a driving force behind the America Healing Initiative and the Truth, Racial Healing and Transformation effort. Dr. Christopher also served as Kellogg's vice president for program. He's a visionary and an architect of the WKAKF led truth, racial healing and transformation effort for America. It has been a pleasure to work with Gail on this commission and let me turn the presentation over to Dr. Christopher now. Thank you, Dr. Paul. Uh, it has been my honor and privilege to work with this distinguished group of commissioners and I certainly applaud the Robert Wood, Found Robert Wood Johnson Foundation for stepping into this space, for organizing this transformational effort. So I'm excited because transformation is really the, the word for us this afternoon. Uh, we're gonna talk about how these recommendations, indeed, how they can lead to transformation of our public health data and data systems. We had a diverse group of commissioners, innovators, practitioners, leaders, academicians, we just had the right people in the room and they worked very hard to create visions that would answer the question, what will our new transformed public health data system look like? And then to, to chart a course for how we actually realize that vision. So again, it was my honor to be involved with the commissioners and to facilitate their very in-depth and meaningful conversations. And that was the deliberative process, but a great deal of work uh, happened prior to even bringing the commissioners together. And you're gonna learn more about that as we spend this time to discuss the recommendations. Next slide, please. So the, we worked from a framework, a comprehensive framework that acknowledges the the depth of the challenge of moving from inequities to equity. And we really worked at figuring out how do we actually center health equity in this work. And so the commissioners came up with three primary, I'm gonna call them buckets for one of a more scientific term, three primary groupings for these recommendations. And the groupings, uh, they emerged from the truth, racial healing, and transformation framework that we use. And those groupings are to center health equity and well being in narrative change. You know, the data, they really create the story, they create the concepts that drive our work. And, and so data actually create the narratives. So making sure that health equity is central to those narratives, and perhaps most importantly, that well-being, that it's not just a deficit frame, that we're actually thinking about what will it take to achieve the desired state, to, to guarantee or to assure the opportunity to thrive for all of our nation's people. And so these recommendations are driving toward that that end game, if you will, in terms of well-being beyond 
a limited disease focus, but actually toward those conditions that will assure the health and well being of the nation. The second grouping is prioritizing equitable governance and community engagement. Now, that simplifies a very complicated challenge, but our current system as it is transformed now in response to what COVID-19 revealed, what our, our long-standing history of health inequities and disparities continue to reveal, the governance of that system and the engagement of that in that system uh, by diverse voices and diverse communities, that's a very important part of the transformation that the commissioners seek. And that is the second big area of, of recommendations. And then the third area is to ensure public health measurement captures and addresses, I would even say redresses, structural racism and other inequities. So we can't just start with the 21st century, even the necessarily the latter part of the 20th century. We have to make sure that our data takes the long view and captures the historic trends and leads us toward equitable solutions that will address the historic patterns that led us to where we are today. I'm very proud of the Commission's recommendations of their forward thinking and their comprehensive approach. Uh, and I believe that the recommendations that fall in these three areas will help us do what might seem to be impossible to some to truly transform our nation's public health data and data systems. We are, are privileged to have representatives of the commission with us today and representatives of the broader group that have worked so hard to make this happen. And so I want to introduce the, the panelists today and I will, I'm privileged to be able to ask them some critical questions, but I certainly encourage members of the panel to, to be creative, to be somewhat spontaneous. And we are of course inviting questions from the audience. But these panelists are going to take a deeper dive into the actual commission process, commission deliberation, and of course, the commission recommendations. So first we have Dr. Anita Chandra. Uh, she is the director, I'm sorry, she is the vice president and director for RAND Social and Economic Wellbeing. She is the senior policy researcher at RAND Corporation. And she's been engaged with this process for at least a year and has been absolutely central to its success. And second, we have Mr. Michael Crawford. He is, he's a commission member and associate dean for strategy, outreach and innovation in the College of Medicine at Howard University and founding executive director of the 1867 Health Innovation Project at Howard University. And then finally, our other commission member that's with us today is, she's a commission member, Dr. Nenez Ponce. Uh, she is the director of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research. She is the principal investigator of the California Health Interview Survey, professor for the Department of Health Policy and Engagement at UCLA, Fielding School of Public Health. So join me in welcoming our panelists. Dr. Anita Chandra, you worked so hard on this commission as we led up to its actual deliberative uh, engagement. Could you tell us about the work that went into getting us ready to deliberate? Uh, it was extensive work, extensive groups were interviewed. Could you share with, with the audience and participants some of the work that went into pre preparation for this commission? Thank you for the question, Dr. Christopher. It really was an honor on behalf of the RAND team to support your leadership and the work of the commission. Uh, and um, we had the privilege of pulling together a lot of the efforts that have been underway on data modernization that precede the commission and to conduct a comprehensive environmental scan. It included um, a series of interviews with a range of stakeholders, both in traditional health, healthcare and public health, but also outside of those sectors, public and private sector. We looked at concurrent modernization models as well as the past. 
and looked at the literature and some of the policies that are in play at the federal, state, and local government level. We wanted to ensure that the commission was anchored to areas of focus and that could think through where were the sticking points in prior modernization transformation efforts and where could the commission really break through with those three commission buckets that you heard Dr. Christopher outline. And what we found really, I think, was foundational to, to the work in the commission that you'll hear amplified by my colleagues from the commission. Um, first and foremost, we went a little deeper on governance and data system transformation. That included um, ensuring that we have policies that support both data use and alignment across federal, state, and local entities, but also starting to think about governance in terms of the public and private sector cooperation that clearly articulate a centralizing theme of data for common good across business and across the public sector. How can we do that in future decision-making structures? And um, we also found a lot of interest to understand the workforce and ongoing infrastructure supports to support staff and structures that can cons consistently really harness older and newer forms of data as new data come online and can also do so in ways that are in that narrative context that Dr. Christopher mentioned, that help people understand how to both contextualize and frame considerations of race, history, and other equity issues. We're not always trained on how to do that. We need better support for our workforce going forward. And finally, we, we need to understand some of the measurement. And in the, some of the supporting white papers, you will see tables that really inventory where we are and where we're not in terms of positive health and well-being measurement, sort of the assets base, as well as how we move beyond the disparities only. What are the historical and legacy measures that we need to use to capture structural and systemic inequities? And many of the stakeholders that we interviewed offer some excellent recommendations in that area. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Uh, I, you know, we keep saying narrative change. We keep talking about well-being and moving to an asset-based focus. We certainly want our narratives to capture the true history, the truth, if you will, as to how we arrived at the points where we are today. Mr. Crawford, could you break that down in more detail and illustrate for us how and why that is so important? I know you served on that group that came up with this recommendation. So we invite you to share more with us in terms of centering health equity and well being in the necessary change of narrative. Thank you, Gail. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Robert Wood Johnson, you, and Alonzo for your leadership. Uh, with this commission. Um, really appreciate for the opportunity to participate in this process and now today to talk about our recommendations for the report. The pandemic amplified the need to change how we tell stories about the health, the health of people and communities. It's time that we rethink and shift how we use data. I, I think the pandemic ha has illuminated that, particularly uh, in the areas of how we uh, establish testing sites throughout communities, how we uh, looked at vaccine dissemination and distribution, and, and how important data was to informing those decisions. It is clear that we need to evolve the narrative to one that's just positively oriented and equity-based, essentially move from a deficit to a strengths-based narrative. The nation's public health system uh, is currently, currently reports on health inequities uh, but those health inequities are, need to be decontextualized uh, from history and the experiences of race and intersectionality and the place that impact health. And although our current systems report on health status and, dis and disparities, data can perpetuate health inequities when they lack appropriate context for understanding of root causes of those inequities. Thank you, Michael. Mr. Crawford, could you... Could you tell us a little bit more about how your day-to-day -day work uh, embodies and reflects this, this work, this challenge? Sure. Um, as you mentioned, you know, I'm the founding executive director of 1867 Health Innovation Project at Howard University. And the program is designed to partner with researchers, entrepreneurs, collaborators, uh, and innovators to address complex challenges confronting medically underserved communities. Um, from a digital health perspective. 
And what we have recognized is that underserved and vulnerable populations lack the appropriate access uh, to technology, uh, as well as the ability to participate in, in data-informed interventions. And our program is designed to create access uh, and work with the provider community, the technology community, to ensure that these technologies uh, are being evaluated uh, in a dynamic clinical environment with input from end users, i.e. the patients, as well as providers that work in these communities to help evolve these technologies in a way that they meet the needs of vulnerable and medically underserved populations. We cannot have innovation uh, in technology without data and having complete data uh, that contextualizes the full story of individuals and patients. So the ability to have data across multiple disparate silos for innovation purposes, particularly within vulnerable and underserved populations is paramount. And the work that we're doing at Howard University's 1867 Health Innovations Project is bringing these individuals together uh, in an environment that promotes um, ideation, co-creation, to ensure that we're using technology and data to improve access, outcomes, affordability, and most importantly, the patient experience. Thank you so much. That's so clear and helpful in its specificity. Dr. Chandra, could, could you elaborate on the issue of governance? You know, uh, we know that if we're gonna make these changes and if we're really gonna transform our system, the issues of governance at all levels, the issues of engagement of communities, and certainly the issues of power and control over data and full representation and full voice of many different diverse perspectives. I think that those issues have to be addressed. And could you speak to us about that challenge? Sure, it's an excellent question. And sometimes the governance question gets short shrift when we talk about systemic transformation. And it really um, uh, is an overriding theme, both from kind of what is collected, um, how it is collected, how the data are stewarded and packaged, who has access to it, and how it gets used and translated, much less how decision-making is sustained. And too often we have different elements potentially of community input, but we don't have really community leadership nested in all stages of that governance model. And that really speaks to the power and authority that you reference um, with respect to community, not just engagement, but authority and leadership working side by side with leaders in the public and private sectors. Uh, and so um, as we kind of move forward and think about different governance models that can adapt to changing conditions and also ensure that we keep uh, community leadership central, we have to be thinking about policies, statutes, and standards that consider community leadership at each stage of that from what to how, uh, to how long and the sustainability of governance. There's also some interesting models that are emerging that um, some of the leading entities um, in the country are pursuing um, that really put community at the center. Community information exchanges, for example, are a useful model to look at. Um, and in those models, there's not just um, consideration of how data and information is moved, but also um, how equity um, and power and authority is centralized. And I think there's some uh, new innovations that we need to take closer look at with respect to governance going forward. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. Dr. Ninez Ponce, uh, it was such a pleasure working with you as a member of this commission. And it's really clear the pandemic, as well as this unprecedented moment of, of racial reckoning in this country, you know, has revealed how weak our, our existing infrastructure is and inadequate in terms of documenting and addressing and enabling us to respond to uh, the issues of structural racism and the consequences that it has in terms of our possibilities for well-being. Could you speak about some of the specific recommendations that the commission made to it boldly, I think, to address this challenge? Yeah, thank, thank you so much, Dr. Christopher. And again, I wanted to thank you for your leadership and to Dr. Plow for his, um, for his leadership. So um, I, I'm a data producer. And um, so exposing structural racism requires that we collect 
analyze, report, and democratize data in ways that accurately reflect the serious harms that racism and other forms of injustice that are inflicted on our communities. So this means that uh, we need to take a hard look at our data systems and asking who the data uh, we collect elevates, who is being centered in our data, and most importantly, in the work, a lot of work that I do is who is being excluded and why. Mm -hmm. So to this end, it's essential that we engage community members in accessing and interpreting public health data and the associated social factors, all the metrics that are and have to be community informed. We also need to invest in community relevant and nationally significant metrics on factors that influence the health outcomes such as ensuring measures of education, occupation, immigration status, multi-generational housing, income inequality, residential segregation, housing precarity, unfair treatment, food insecurity. These are just some examples, and they should be measured as best as possible in administrative data systems and in population-based survey data. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Chandra. I'm sorry, Dr. Nines Ponce. Um, I, Dr. Chandra, we, we know that this work for this commission started long before the deliberation of the commission members. And we know that the foundation was giving grants, they called them quick strike grants to community groups that were nested, you know, across the country. Could you speak to and give us some examples? Because these groups are actually doing this work already and they informed the deliberations of the commission members. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was terrific work that the foundation has um, been supporting and really a, a pleasure to get to know some of these innovations. I encourage you to look at all of those kind of grantee snapshots in the white papers um, because I think there's real richness. Um, but I'll just give you a couple of examples since we're on the conversation about community engagement and around measures. So as I mentioned earlier, community information exchanges really um, have some promise to be more proactive and inclusive by promoting community-led approaches to collecting uh, accurate data, really, from individuals bearing most of the health burdens. So 211 in San Diego and um, the Community Information Exchange National Community Council are working together to develop and advance a strategic agenda on how do we align these multi-sector data sharing initiatives that many of you I know calling in today um, are leading? How do we create a um, culture of health equity through meaningful systems change? So that's very exciting. 211 has actually also been working with the private sector. They worked with DoorDash and food pantries to help address food access and economic recovery from COVID-19. I know we have many business leaders on the call today um, this is a great example of data for the common good. Um, another example in the space of health equity is um, what Recode is doing. This is the Rising Equitable Community Data Ecosystems Learning Council. They're really thinking about equitable and accessible data ecosystems, really about that shifting power, um, how to think about ownership of data, how to create the feedback loops, particularly in the context uh, building capacity and democratizing data skills, which we'll need now more than ever. So a range of quick strike grantees doing tremendous work in governance, community engagement, measures. Dr. Ponce has been leading some wonderful work. Um, so just a couple of examples, uh, hopefully to whet your appetite. Thank you so much, panelists. You've been a, done an excellent job of, I hope, bringing the audience into the reality of the recommendations from this commission. And one of the things that stood out to me most when I was invited to direct it was that these recommendations were for the nation. They weren't for one sector, they were for all sectors. Because in a democracy, that's how transformation happens. So I'm going to invite Dr. Alonzo Plough to come in and, and lead us in a deeper discussion of the call to action to so many sectors to really make this a reality. Alonzo? Great, uh, thank you, and, and wonderful, wonderful uh, dis discussion. Uh, again, as, as the panelists uh, talked about so clearly and as the report lays out, uh, we talk about public health data systems that we're really talking about across many different sectors to really provide usable information to address these challenges 
uh, that we have all all talked about. And this real call to action is to envision how we can transform and improve the way these sectors work together using data to provide the right narrative that leads to better health justice uh, and more racial equity and equity in general and health outcomes. So I have a, a few, I'm gonna moderate this session and section and I'm gonna start out with Dr. Ponce. Uh, who's had so much experience uh, using data uh, to uh, in, in an interaction with with governmental leadership in the state of California. Uh, so, Dr. Ponce, government as well as uh, private and other sectors have this role to play uh, around transforming the way we think about public data systems. Uh, you've talked about what the federal government can do, uh, but you have been such a such a leader uh, with the California Health Industry Survey and in how you uh, are able to use these data at a state and local level. Maybe share some of your experience about the power of using more local um, and hyper local data for change at that level. Thanks, Alonzo. Uh, so yeah, I think I want to put out there that you're not going to get any equity without data equity. So that's the first piece. And that you also won't get data that sings truth about populations unless you bring in those populations in the design, the planning, the dissemination, the use and the value process. And that's what we've done in California with the California Health Interview Survey is that from the beginning to the end that we do bring in uh, various stakeholders, both from local, you know, county, local health departments, from, um, from state government, from community organizations, from advocates. Um, academics are also invited. But it, it, it's, <laughs> it's a way that we have this, this stakeholder engagement um, where, um, you know, sometimes one sector may overlook emerging needs or things that we don't hear. So for example, one sector may care more about behaviors, healthy behaviors, but overlooking housing stability, for example, or you know, uh, prevention of gun violence, for example. So, so I do think that um, um, we don't really have a secret sauce or a formula, except that we are open for engagement. We want a process where we have um, community engagement. And when I say community, it's various sectors. It's community-based organizations, it's local governments, it's philanthropy, um, you know, and it's, um, I think it's, it's social movements are also really important because it's the social movements that kickstart the conscience of, I think, you know, state and local governments. And um, again, that's an important ingredient in terms of getting data equity. That's great, great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Crawford, can you talk about what actions schools and healthcare systems can take, drawing on your experience at, at Howard and in DC? Thank you, Alonzo, for the question. And I'll build on uh, my colleague's response, Dr. Ponce, in terms of creating an opportunity for diverse voices to be a part of the discussion. Uh, in the design, I think academia can play a critical role uh, in training the next generation of public health workers, uh, data scientists, uh, and social workers, health professionals that can help bolster, illuminate, and drive this process around data equity, uh, product inclusion, et cetera. So I think, I think academia will, can play a very pivotal role. They also can serve as a convener. Uh, for thought leadership discussions, information dissemination, um, bringing community to, together uh, here in Washington, D.C. Uh, Howard University is a very trusted voice in the community. Uh, so I can see us and other universities throughout the country bringing community-based organizations, the faith community, um, other nonprofits to the table to talk about solutions that are inclusive. Um, I also think about the public health sector uh, and we've seen how important their role has been uh, in being a convener in terms of bringing multi-sector partners together. I think the public health sector can play a pivotal role in terms of trying to bring the stakeholders to the table. Also building capacity, diversity, and training, uh, working with academia to develop pipeline projects to be able to do that and making sure that we have the appropriate capacity to be able to uh, implement some of the solutions that we're talking about. And then the last piece, I'll talk about health systems because I know we're running short on time. Health systems 
have a panoply of data uh, that they can share with others. Uh, so I know health information exchanges is a place where this is occurring, uh, but I think that there could be other data sets, other information that could be shared to help create more meaningful insights and interventions that we can improve the health and well-being of all communities. That's a, a great information, and, and those such or in organizations are so situated locally, so that data is going to be very salient and actionable at, at the level where those institutions uh, are, are placed. Um, Dr. Chandra, um, um, a lot of what we're talking about here uh, does address uh, the governmental public health system. Again, not exclusively, but it's a big part of all of this. Uh, please talk a little bit about uh, what public health can do to make sure our data systems are better equipped to, to handle the next public health emergency. And again, as you know, and all the audience knows, this is a public health system that has not had the kind of investment in it to uh, be sufficiently robust. And that certainly has come out in some of the challenges in the response uh, to, to COVID-19. Yeah, thanks. And I'll just build on um, what Mr. Crawford said. I, I love public health and I, I hope this is an opening for kind of a step function uh, for the field. Um, a couple of other areas, you know, one thing um, public health enjoys is understanding the multiple sectors that influence health and well-being. Um, but there is an opportunity to look closer at some of the data sharing agreements. Um, not just with local health systems and healthcare and how to exercise that in the network on public health laws doing some terrific work in this space, but also how to um, streamline some of that data sharing going forward uh, across some of the sectors that Dr. Ponsai mentioned, uh, but also in working with the private sector. In terms of the public health workforce, I understand that um, we have a bump in schools of public health of people joining the profession and getting interested because of the pandemic. Um, and it means training that future and current workforce, not just in data science and data informatics, but also some of the narrative work that we've been talking about today, how to speak um, clearly um, about the context and the history, how to use some of that social change, social movement theory that Dr. Ponce talked about. This is not necessarily a skill that we always put front and center in training the public health workforce. And then finally, we do need that investment, um, Dr. Plow, as you noted, in terms of the modernization efforts to get some of that real-time data usable, not necessarily always the most precise, but enough to help us make some of the decision. And this is where the partnership across federal, state, and local government matters, but also the skill sets to work with the private sector and work with our, our colleagues in tech. Um, getting those agreements in place will be um, the challenge for the public health workforce in the sector going forward. Great, great. Um, and I, and I also have a, have a deep regard for from coming from 25 years of being a, a frontline public health practitioner. And I think this is a real moment uh, to build on the capacities and the knowledge the sectors had and then broaden the, the engagement with both community and, and other sectors. So with those great comments uh, from the panel, I am turning uh, it back over to Dr. Christopher to moderate uh, the audience Q&A. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Plow. And before we dive into the audience Q&A, and we do encourage you to submit your questions, I do, I do invite you, Dr. Plow, to talk about the role that the business sector and philanthropy might play in um, modernizing, for want of a better word, I will say transforming our nation's public health data systems. Yes, Dr. Christopher. I think um, we have a large role to play, and let me let me tackle the the philanthropic role uh, first. We have a few other uh, folks from other philanthropies around the country who are working on this. Uh, we uh, can be a great catalyst for what it means, I think, on the uh, on the philanthropic side to um, make data modernization and interconnectivity uh, not just a technical improvement over the status quo, but to really embrace. Um, the broader principles uh, that this uh, commission report uh, has, has talked about around equity, local engagement, data for action to address structural 
health problems like structural racism and other marginalizing factors that really are driving the kind of health inequities that we want to solve as a nation. Uh, they were manifested in a dramatic way during COVID-19, but those kinds of, of inequalities existed before COVID-19. And uh, hopefully this is a moment uh, to do broad systemic work across sectors to um, make sure that we don't replicate that kind of inequity in the future. Uh, I'll talk a little more, bit more that RWJF is, uh, a, a, again, with all the other work that we're doing that I mentioned on the data front and many of our programming focused a lot on these structural issues, but we are going to be uh, awarding uh, $50 million uh, in uh, particular funding to address the specific recommendations uh, of the, the um, National Public Health uh, Commission. Uh, and I'll just mention a couple of these projects uh, 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 in overview. Um, and they tie directly to the commission's recommendation. Uh, uh, one uh, set of, of grants uh, are going to be to transform local data environments to eliminate systemic barriers and provide more timely, accurate uh, information. Uh, and a lot of that is going to be focused uh, uh, really on trying to um, really model in certain places around the country what it means to have these, these, these cross-sector, community-oriented, more hyper-local data systems uh, and to model that capacity in kind of a learning community way. Uh, building community academic partnerships. And Mr. Crawford talked about the importance of, of uh, the academy in this. Um, and we will be working uh, uh, with a consortium of historical black colleges and universities in the Gulf Coast and other regions to really address some of the confluence of, of improving health equity, a region that is disproportionately impacted by a variety of disasters, um, and how can we combine data both about environmental risk and ongoing social determinants of health issues uh, in that Gulf region. Um, and then again, one of the major recommendations from the uh, commission, uh, again, to tell the right kind of data story that leads us to action, we have to have better and much more meaningful disaggregation of the data uh, so we can go beyond these, these broad um, um, racial and ethnic categories to really understand with, with more granularity how we can uh, improve uh, the health of, of, of people who have been marginalized unfairly because, because of race. Uh, so we will be, uh, each one of these uh, it, uh, provides opportunities for a variety of other grants. Um, and uh, I will come back to some of this in a minute in the close. But uh, uh, again, on the private sector side, it, uh, as Dr. Christopher said, we were fortunate to have a number of private sector leaders on the commission. I can say that we have, uh, we are engaged right now with many of those tech leaders and other sector leaders who want to play a role um, in, in envisioning a, a, a data system, an equitable oriented information system to ad address uh, health equity and improve health equity across the country. So we're excited about this, uh, both working with our governmental partners, CDC and others, and uh, other sectors going forward. Thank you very Thank you. much. Uh, we do have some questions from the audience. We also have some questions that came in before from participants before today's panel. So I'm going to sort of mix and match, if I might. Uh, I would like to throw out to anybody on the panel, and I, I'm sort of leaning toward Dr. Nene's Ponce because I, I know your work is so community focused. But the question of interoperability kind of came up during deliberations. It comes up throughout our discussions. You know, one system doesn't talk to another system. So, so could you speak to any recommendations that emerged that would address this challenge of interoperability of our data systems? Thank, thanks, Gail. So what I learned a lot from, from um, the other commissioners, my colleagues, um, was that interoperability is not just about computers talking to each other. No, it's about people talking to each other and relating to each other and really being under the skin of understanding what matters most in terms of data that represents you know, their experience. Um, so in terms of, but there are different data systems. Um, and a way forward would be to make sharing and pulling data um, the default, you know, versus the 
the dream way ahead and the challenge, but the default for agencies. So this comes again, like in terms of the carrot and the stick, um, because no one sector institution holds all the data needed to understand the factors, right, that drive the inequities in health and well-being. So money is tying data expectations to federal payments is also a well-established practice that um, that um, could be done. And then in recent years, for example, federal government has leveraged incentive programs to promote interoperability in the collection of a standardized set of data through the Centers for uh, Medicare and Medicaid Services, um, the Meaningful Use Program, for example. But I just know that from my experience, you can't have a mandate alone, say on what OMB compliance is, or that in California, we have the AHEAD Act where you can, where there's, there is encouragement of collecting more disaggregated data, but without the incentives or appropriations, mm -hmm. uh, tying it to, to monies, to county monies, whether it comes to the state or the feds, uh, it's, it's not going to be operationalized. This interoperability isn't going to happen. Sure. Um, Dr. Chandra, would you like to elaborate at all on that question? And I'm going to loop it in with another question that's come in from the audience, which is some examples of how the tech sector uh, might be helping local health departments, specifically helping to make things more affordable for local health departments to update and modernize their systems. Yeah, I mean, um, it's a great question. Um, first, I would say, just to add to Dr. Ponce, as we think about some of these um, supports, uh, how do we start to get to kind of a standardization that also helps in the not only the reporting, but the talking to each other? Um, we don't necessarily capture everything the same way in terms of demographic and health measures. And so public health departments and local entities kind of need that clarity uh, in terms of how we're coding and analyzing information, still contextually consistent, but, but some um, level of, of consistency and standardization, particularly as we take in structural inequity and well-being data. In terms of the tech sector, we there's some examples um, that uh, I won't detail completely, but we are seeing some some both smaller tech companies as well as some of the larger entities that many of you are aware of um, working with health departments to provide supporting data. Um, that some of the tech companies have access to that are able to capture elements of positive health and well being, or capture elements of, of social determinants of health in a way that the health department is not able to based on capacity or access to that information. Um, but also providing some of the translation support of how one packages and displays or visualize or communicates that data. These are skills that are very much tied up in, in many of our private sector partners, particularly tech companies, and providing that support locally can really make the difference in terms of how, how data is communicated locally and how it's used for policy and resource allocation. So we're seeing these kind of public-private partnerships working out very nicely the question is, is how do we do that more consistently across all regions, all localities, so that some of our smaller local health departments have access to that tech capacity as well? Yeah. Thank you very much, which, you know, you did a beautiful segue into another question. We've been talking about social determinants of health and well-being for decades. Uh, I think our opportunity now is to translate that into the data sphere if you will. And so I would invite any of you to speak to the, the capacity and, and perhaps even some examples of how an individual's social determinants of health and well-being can find its way into our, our public health data system and into our data systems of tracking and measuring progress. And, and, and I'll take the first stab at the question. Okay. Uh, you know, I, I recently had a conversation with um, health information exchanges uh, through an, a, uh, an ONC meeting. And we talked about this exact concept, data health equity and how, what, what are some of the gaps and what is some of the data being captured? And there were a number of HIEs throughout the country that were capturing social determinants of health data. However, everyone wasn't capturing social determinants of health data throughout the country and they were doing it slightly differently. So as Dr. Trondry mentioned, that in order for you to be able to analyze and translate the data, you have to have consistent data capture, consistent data standards to be able to interpret this data. 
What we do know is that 80% of what happens in healthcare is outside of the brick and mortar structure of the healthcare environment. So those are those social determinants of health, housing, pharmacy, uh, how many pharmacies are, are in a community, um, education, uh, also um, around gun violence and some of those other things that, that contribute uh, to poor healthcare outcomes. So I think having a consistent uh, way in terms of how you capture that data, particularly in the HIE environment, so there, because there's already a built-in infrastructure, um, can help in terms of being able to analyze that data at scale uh, and then pairing it with some payer data to create more meaningful insights for individuals and communities. Oh, I can't believe this. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Crawford. And, and I can't believe time is going so quickly. There is one question I'm going to ask you to answer, Dr. Chandra, which, which speaks to the, the laws in state and local communities, primarily states, that might serve as barriers to our bigger vision for uh, improving you know, public health data, transforming public health data systems. Yeah, actually, one of the grantees to the foundation who's been doing great work is the Network for Public Health Law, and I encourage people to look at some of the work that they're doing. They undertook a study to understand the authority of health departments to collect race and ethnicity data, where there are actually legal barriers versus perceived barriers, and obligations to share data in response to requests. And as they looked at some of those states, they found that health departments are authorized in many ways to collect data about race, ethnicity, um, but there are, there's difference in terms of what is considered confidential, de-identification, what could be published and the like. Their early conclusions really suggest um, that there are legitimate privacy interests, um, but there are some things that we need to look at state by state in terms of um, what is really constitutional or statutory right of privacy. Uh, my takeaway, and certainly they could speak more about this, is that we've got some room here um, to be more flexible in how we're capturing some of these data, um, still with respecting privacy. And we need to kind of revisit some of the flexibility in the public health legal standards, what's perceived, what's real, what makes sense going forward, given the shift in our context and our environment what is actually legal um, or not legal, and then what is really um, kind of being prohibited because there's a culture or not a culture around data sharing. So some really interesting work to look at some of the laws and policies, but, but they and others are really leading the charge wow. um, in terms of how public health departments and healthcare work together, but also how data are shared across sectors. Okay. Mr. Crawford, could you lift up a couple of best practices to helping public health systems and public health data experts in particular to overcome the legacy of discriminatory and racist and structural racism practices? I, I think one of the biggest things that we can do is look at our governance and, and stewardship models. If, if you look at the governance structures, I do not think that they're reflective of the community in which they serve. Um, I think this is a, an opportunity to start um, looking at how do you diversify those governance and stewardship structures in order to ensure that the voices of all communities are, are represented. I think that will lead to some informed insights about how we should be capturing data, what is sensitive data, what is proprietary, um, what, what is uh, data that is misunderstood uh, in terms of nomenclature. Uh, so I think that there, there, it, starts, it starts and ends, in my opinion, with, with governance and stewardship models. And, and, and I think that that was a strong call out and recommendation in this report. Thank you so much. I mean, that is one of our, that's our central area of the three areas of the recommendations. And so I am very optimistic that if embraced and applied the recommendations of this commission, will go a long way toward charting a course for transforming our nation's public health data systems. And I want to thank our panelists, Dr. Nunez Ponce, Michael Crawford, Dr. Anita Chandra, not only for your work today, but for your ongoing and tireless work on behalf of this project. I'm going to turn it back over to you, Dr. Plow, uh, to bring us home, so to speak. Right, right. And, and the four minutes that we have left and some closing remarks. Well, what a wonderful uh, discussion. And you, you heard with uh, Dr. Christopher and the other commission members just a little bit of insight of the kind of dynamic conversation and insights uh, that uh, all the commissioners shared uh, that are reflected in this report. And I really encourage all of you to get a copy of this, look at it. Um, it's it again. We we were so pleased uh, with the 
quality and the dedication of their time uh, and, and Dr. Christopher's time, particularly as a leader of this to uh, move this to uh, completion in record time in a little over a year. Uh, next slide, please. I mentioned, um, I mentioned that uh, the funding opportunities uh, from uh, the foundation, uh, the 50 million in those three areas, but that's just some of the significant funding opportunities uh, that are available. So um, uh, we, we, want, we want you to be uh, on the lookout for calls for proposals that will come from those three areas in early uh, 2022, but you can uh, uh, get more information and download this whole report um, on the um, on, on the, the link that is that is indicated here, um, I would just in, in closing say um, the spirit of the of the commission and the spirit of of RWJF in setting out this process was to develop a broad um, collaborative process that would grow and include. Uh, folks in, interested in these areas, working in these areas at all levels of, of government, community, uh, the business sector, uh, to really chart a different course. And we're so excited uh, that those dialogues are continuing. Uh, we will have a landing page on the website where you can see that dialogue continuing. The kind of questions uh, that came in from the audience, and again, we weren't able to answer them all in real time, uh, are excellent. Um, I just will mention one in closing because it's so clear that the recommendations of this report uh, really uh, have an opportunity now to help inform uh, the infusion of funding uh, related to data at CDC and state and local government. And I just wanted to assure the questioner, many questioners who uh, asked about that, yes, we are in great dialogue with CDC leadership, um, uh, their existing thinking and current thinking about uh, data modernization. Um, and uh, they have this report and we will continue to work with them and hope that these recommendations of the commission uh, will continue to shape and inform uh, the uh, great funding that they have received from the administration to pursue this. So again, uh, thank you all for taking time to be with us uh, this afternoon. Watch for more information and download the report. Um, and again, thank you for your interest. And again, thank the commissioners on the panel, as well as the others who are not for what has been just a fabulous project from the perspective of the foundation. So good afternoon or morning for whatever time zone you're in. Thank you all. Bye. Bye.